So I'm here to talk with you all about mentorship and sponsorship. There's a link up here to a resources page. If you visit larahogan.me slash sponsors, you can see all of these slides and a ton of resources and stuff. There's also gonna be one part of this presentation in which I'm gonna ask you to write some stuff down. So if you have a notebook handy, get that out. Otherwise, you can definitely type it in your phone, but that's gonna be slower. So feel free to dig into your bags for that. And as you do that, I'll start talking about why we're here. So we're obviously all in this room because we want to grow and learn. I definitely wouldn't be where I am today without getting to know so many folks that come to events like these. The actual talks and the casual conversations can be so valuable. I bet we can all attest to the fact that in order to grow one's leadership skills, it's critical to lean on your network of support. We know we're not going to get far if we try to do all of this solo. We in this room have probably found mentors to help us grow and learn, people who can give us helpful advice. I have learned so much from folks with whom I've shared an office and shared stages like this with throughout my career. I hope that you already have a handful of mentors whom you currently lean on to help you grow. This photo is from a conference in 2014. The guy in the front is John Alspa. I have had the honor of leaning on this guy as a mentor for years. He has helped me through so much. He has given me critical advice through many of my biggest career moments. Yes, he sends me a lot of PDFs of academic research as advice too, but this guy has been one person who I go to when I'm faced with a technical leadership challenge that I've never seen before. He helps me learn a lot by sharing his perspective and experience with me, and he knows me pretty well so he knows what kind of advice would be most helpful to me with any given problem. This is what great mentorship looks like. Christy Tillman also taught me about how mentors, in addition to giving you advice, can give you visible proximity and tangential relationships to a broader network and to more opportunities. For sure, having a mentor in someone like John has given me access to a lot more people who have an even broader set of experiences and advice. So what makes a good mentor? So I gave this talk for the Association of Women Surgeons, which is a super different AWS than the one that I'm otherwise most familiar with. The engineers in the room will laugh at that joke. So uh, Strategies for Building an Effective Mentoring Relationship was written and published on AWS's website, and it's just phenomenal. It talks through choosing a mentor, developing that relationship, and the responsibility of the mentee and the mentor, and so much more. Here are just some really brief highlights. As the article details, a personal fit is important since differences in values can seriously undermine a mentoring relationship. Qualities of a successful relationship includes honesty, active listening, flexibility, reciprocity, mutual respect, a personal connection, and shared values. Without these qualities, you might have a less than productive mentorship experience, which is frankly as just a, as much of a waste of your time as it is for your mentee. Folks should have more than one mentor because, as we all know, we can't be one person's everything. Mentees should probably want to develop multiple mentoring relationships over the course of their career in order to be successful. And my favorite bit that truly hits home, the workaholic mentor without any personal life may be a great research advisor, but might not be someone to emulate their behavior. So I like to ask individual contributors and managers, who can you lean on for the different aspects of your own growth? There will be people in your life with different strengths, different weaknesses, different amounts of time that they can devote to helping you. So don't ever put all of your hopes on just one mentor. Find a diverse group of folks whom you can lean on as you grow. Mentoring requires an investment of time, energy, and emotional resources. And our mentorship relationships evolve over time because I'm growing and my mentee is growing. It's on us as mentors to respect them and give advice that's current and sensitive to the changing dialogue that happens in our industry. Advice that might work for one person may destroy another person's career. So be a responsible mentor and stay up to date on topics of inclusion especially. And don't perceive your mentee as a threat. Be generous with credit. Imaginative, innovative ideas often come from the more green folks in our midst. As mentors, we want our mentees to reach beyond us because our mentees' success is ultimately our success. And here's a tip you should share with any future mentees. I might be a great mentor for someone else, but not the right mentor for you, so I want to assure you, as this article does, it's okay to stop being mentored by someone. 
I also like to remind folks that while I hope that they won't encounter a mentee, a mentor who treats them poorly or inappropriately, we all know that that can happen too. I've seen competition between a mentor and a mentee become an issue between them. It's okay for either side to say, thanks for your time. I'm gonna go focus on this project I'm working on and walk away. And if I'm walking away as a mentor, I usually try to give them a handful of names of people who might be a better fit or might have more time to invest in that kind of relationship. But I'm up here to tell you about another way that folks can help each other get to the next level, sponsorship. And I don't mean like the money bags kinds of sponsorship. Sponsors help us find new opportunities and improve the visibility of our work. Sponsors feel on the hook for helping us level up our game. They're not just there to give coaching and advice, although that's a part of it. They're there to help see growth opportunities and put our name in the ring for them. This is Courtney Nash. I met her at a technical conference at a lunch table. The table was organized so that all the women who were attending the conference, there weren't many of us, could meet each other and get to know each other. So I learned that Courtney worked at O'Reilly and I was like, oh hey, I have this book idea. Courtney did give me advice about how to make that pitch to the publisher, but more importantly, she helped me actually put my name in the ring with them. She sold O'Reilly on the book idea after I sent my proposal, which in turn gave me my first big shot at writing a real print book. Most of the ways that she sponsored me were invisible to me, but it's clear that Courtney believed in me, advocated for me, and cleared the way so I could really grow as a leader. Economist and professor Erminia Ibarra says, in mentorship, the connection to actually getting promoted and actually getting developmental assignments gets kind of diluted. Sponsorship has to do with fighting to get somebody a promotion, mentioning their name in appointments meeting, and making sure that the person you're sponsoring gets the next assignment and gets visible and developmental assignments. So while mentorship is really handy when it comes to thinking through problems or getting advice on how someone else has tackled issues before, sponsorship is much more directly correlated to career trajectory. As Kate Houston at Automatic says, mentors give perspective, sponsors give opportunity. This is because to sponsor someone is to feel on the hook to help them get promoted. It is raising up the name of someone to help them get more opportunities to do visible, valuable work. It can also advice, include giving advice and mentorship, but that's not why it's most effective. As Kate says in her excellent blog post on the subject, sponsoring someone can be super small too. Giving someone a book, giving them access to your network, making an intro for them, referring them to a job. It is really likely that you've had a sponsor in your career and you've already been a sponsor for someone too, even if you didn't realize it. Anytime you suggest that someone work on a high impact project or pass along a speaking opportunity to someone who has a great talk to share, or if you tell someone's manager that they're doing a great job, that's sponsorship. And it is incredibly effective, way more so than mentorship. The Center for Talent Innovation measured the career benefits for men and for women. Apologies, this study didn't include data about non-binary folks. So this study found that without a sponsor behind them, 43% of men and 36% of women will ask their manager for a stretch assignment. With sponsor support, the numbers rise respectively to 56% and 44%. This is huge. Imagine how many more opportunities these folks will have to do visible, valuable work just, for ask, just by asking for more challenging and impactful work. Having a sponsor results in monetary advantages as well. So the majority of unsponsored men and women resist asking for their boss for a raise, but with a sponsor in their corner, nearly half of men and 38% of women will summon the courage to negotiate. Again, imagine the impact that just the act of having a sponsor can have on someone's confidence in negotiating for more compensation. This study found in total that a sponsor uh, confers a statistical career benefit of anything from 22 to 30%, depending upon what's being requested, an assignment or a pay raise, and who's asking, men or women. This is enormous. <laughs> I'm surprised that more people out in the world aren't talking yet about finding sponsors for themselves. As humans, we naturally think through who can give us that advice that we're looking for. It's time to think more about the power of giving opportunities also. So people on your team might ask you, how do you go about finding a sponsor? How hard is it to find someone who's willing to go out on a limb for you to help you achieve that career growth? So here's what I'll tell you. First, obviously, do great and impactful work. 
Make it easy for someone to vouch for you. Do work that saves people time or money or brain power. Do work that levels up the game of those around you. Sponsorship is high stakes. I like to remind folks that when you get a sponsor, you're asking them to put their reputation on the line for you. That relationship is predicated on the power dynamic at play in our work. Sponsors will be leveraging their power and their reputation on your behalf. So make sure you're doing everything in your power to ensure that this is a risk worth your sponsor taking. Next, I tell folks to find someone who knows your work, someone who has seen what you're responsible for, has seen you deliver on projects, has seen you uh, be technical or, or super leadership-y. Often the person who you report to, your manager, is the most obvious sponsor for you, but I encourage you to think more broadly than that. Who else has seen the good work that you do? Who else is qualified to talk about what you've been up to and how helpful you've been to others? Could they be a sponsor for you too? Grab them for coffee sometime. Don't just walk in there and ask generically to put your name in for things. Get specific and make sure you can back that specific request up with action. Give them the opportunity to lift up your name and also give them some supporting evidence for why they should. Throughout the relationship, keep your sponsor updated on your work and your progress. Let them know all the ways that your work has been helping others or delivering on your goals or helping your team do even more things. Make it super easy for your sponsor to tell others about you. And this should be obvious, but I'd like to underscore this. Make sure your work continues to level up those around you and be the kind of work that others want to vouch for. Nobody wants to sponsor someone who's being a jerk or being selfish or frankly, not making that sponsor look good. Again, a sponsor is putting their reputation on the line for you. Show up and be amazing. In Camille Fournier's excellent book, The Manager's Path, there's a section called, You Are Responsible for Yourself. <laughs> She's writing about managers, but I have often quoted this to individual contributors around me. This rings true for any sponsor relationship. Camille says, knowing yourself is step one. Step two is going after what you want. I tell people looking to grow in their careers to bring agendas to your meeting with your boss when you have things you need to talk about. And when you want to work on projects, ask, advocate for yourself. As Camille writes, you will not get everything you ask for, and asking is not usually a fun or comfortable experience. However, it's the fastest way forward. So let's look at this from a slightly different angle. The people in this room have a lot of power. You have plenty of opportunities to be a sponsor for someone. You have opportunities to lift up people's names for promotions or projects or speaking gigs or writing a company blog post. As you think about who you might lift up for these opportunities, I want to especially call out that members of underrepresented groups in our industry, like people of color or women and non-binary people, are over-mentored but under-sponsored. This means that marginalized folks get lots of advice, even unsolicited advice. We get a ton of people offering to take us out to coffee or teach us something new or be a mentor, but it is much more rare for us to have people offer help that looks more like sponsorship. Why is this? It's not because people are intentionally ignoring underrepresented groups, but because of how our brains and social networks work, the people we name are naturally the people that we're closest to, and more often than not, those are the people who look like us. It has to do with something called in-group bias. So here's that time for that exercise. You have your notebooks out or your phones? Yes. All right, I'm going to ask you to write down some names. The first one is think about the last time you asked someone for advice. Was it today, yesterday, last week? Picture that person who you asked for advice and write down their name. Next one, think about the last time you passed along a job description to someone you know. Got it? Write down the name of the person who you passed that job description along to. Think about the most recent email introduction you gave, hopefully a double opt-in email intro. Who was it for? Who was it an intro to? Write down both of their names. Think about the last time you gave someone a book to read that you found super helpful. Who was the book author? <laughs> Who did you give the book to? Write down both of their names. If you're a manager, think about the last person you promoted. Write down their name. 
So when you're ready, take a look at that list. How many of the people on it are the same gender as you? Or the same ethnicity? Went to the same college as you did? Have super similar opinions on microservices or <laughs> React? This, my friends, is in-group bias. And it takes so much work to combat this very natural aspect of how we network and support others. Candidly, until I started learning about this stuff, most of the people I sponsored were white, cisgendered women. Since then, I have worked really hard at finding people to sponsor who are people of color and non-binary people. It takes really hard work and intention to combat these instincts. Having a sponsor provides enormous career benefits for members of underrepresented groups. For example, with a sponsor, women in science, engineering, and technology fields are 70% more likely to have their ideas endorsed, 119% more likely to see them developed, and 200% more likely to see them implemented. However, it is risky for members of underrepresented groups to sponsor people who look like them. There's an HBR article that I linked to on that resources page, larahogan.me slash sponsors, that details a study in which participants rated non-white managers and female managers as less effective when they hired a non-white or female job candidate instead of a white male candidate. It didn't matter whether white male managers chose to hire a white male, white female, non-white male, non-white female. There was no difference in how participants rated their competence and performance. Basically, all managers were judged harshly if they hired someone who looked like them, unless they were a white man. I can cite a ton of studies that confirm that we assess the talent and skill of underrepresented minorities or URMs differently. For example, multiple studies have shown that when you remove gender or race data from people interviewing for a job, but do not change the quality of applicants, white women and candidates of color are suddenly deemed equally qualified as white men. Marginalized groups already work extremely hard and frankly have to be extremely good at what they do to combat the systemic privilege and unconscious bias at play in our work environments. Because of these things, members of underrepresented groups in STEM fields are consistently underpromoted and undercompensated for this work, even though it's measurably exceptional work. What members of underrepresented groups in our fields need most is opportunity and advice, or opportunity and visibility rather, rather than pure advice. That's why sponsorship is so effective for them. So what can you do today to be a sponsor for people who don't look like you? Take a look at the daily communications that you participate in, your work chat logs, the conversations you have with your manager, the process for figuring out who should work on a ticket or who should be promoted. Uh, basically, make sure you understand how your teams are making their work visible. You'll be surprised at how many moments there are throughout an, an average day to sponsor someone. It can be as simple as in Slack, someone hopping in saying, hey, the dashboards are slow today. Is there someone who knows how to fix this? And maybe a sponsor meanders in and says, oh, Max fixed our dashboards before. Maybe ask them. Another sponsor meanders in and says, hey, Sarah's also been doing a lot of performance work recently. Ask her too. Raise up their names. Vouch for them and their work and how that might be a good fit for a leadership opportunity. Make their good work more visible to those who aren't familiar. And if you're not familiar with your sponsees, work or skill set, get familiar. Stay up to date on what they're working on, what kinds of problems they're good at solving, and what they're excited to learn. Keep your eyes peeled for opportunities to raise their name and vouch for their work. And you shouldn't be doing this for an allyship cookie. The person you're sponsoring doesn't even need to know that you're sponsoring them. As my mentor and sponsor, John Allspaugh, says, as you grow in technical leadership, it's also on you to lift up the skills and expertise of those around you. I'd like to take this one step further, that we should be lifting up the names of those around us for opportunities that we see ahead, of shouting from the rooftops about their really incredible work. Future leaders are all around us. I am so excited to see people in this room go out there and help our industry move forward in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have time for Q&A. Um, I'd love to open things up. What would you tell people who either because of, let's say, pride or overconfidence or even fear on the other end of the spectrum are kind of reluctant to go find a sponsor or, or a mentor? Totally. It can be so scary to ask for that help. 
I definitely recommend everybody in this room reads the manager, manager's path, whether or not uh, you're in the discipline engineering that Camille writes about, because it's so good about articulating why it's really on you and you are the person who cares the most about your own career growth. Like, you can't expect those around you to understand or care as deeply about your trajectory as much as you do. So really read that chapter and like just take a few steps towards articulating why you want the next role or the next path or the next project and just ask one person for help with that. Awesome. Uh, questions? Q&A is my favorite part, so please help me out. Sorry, was the one over here? Hi, um, do you have stats for how mentorship affects whether people ask for raises or not? Nope, just sponsorship. Okay. Yeah, it's exponentially more, more uh, impactful. All right, thanks. Not even worth me doing the research on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what advice would you give to people who are afraid to negotiate their own salary? <laughs> find a <sponsor>. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, or come talk to me. Yep, find me, I'll help. Lara at where-with-all.com. And speaking of, we didn't, uh, you should talk a little bit about Wherewithal. Oh, yeah. What am I doing? Uh, so I work at a company called Wherewithal um, with my partner, uh, business partner, Deepa Subramaniam. She's incredible. We met when she was the VP of product at Kickstarter, and I was the VP of engineering at Kickstarter. And uh, we just have an incredible chemistry. Um, so we decided to create a consulting business. So we are currently working at a bunch of different uh, startups, nonprofits, et cetera, around New York City, helping to improve the health of product and engineering organizations. So we coach managers. We advise leaders. I'm doing a bunch of work developing career ladders and skills matrices and group facilitated stuff. It's, it's the most fun I've ever had. So if your companies are interested in any of those things, same, email me. Thanks, Dan. Of course. And one more riff on that a little bit. What are uh, typically the things that you work on first with first-time managers? Like if they're the top one or two things that you always see time and time again, what are those? Time and time again, it's energy drain, managing energy drain, because like who recently became a first-time manager? Anybody? A couple hands. Yeah. You're probably the most tired you've ever been in your life, just because like it's so hard to understand your... Um, how you define success or how you feel successful at the end of the day. Uh, so that's number one. I actually have a recent blog post about this. I would recommend you check out. Uh, and number two is probably how you have not awkward one-on-ones. It's really, really hard. Uh, I have more blog posts for that as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, cool. Hi, um, when I was reading Lean In, uh, Sheryl Sandberg was talking about how women are more likely to ask other people like, hey, can you be my mentor or my sponsor? And she's like, don't do it that way. That's not natural. It should kind of occur naturally. Um, and you spoke to it a bit, like let your work speak for yourself. But do you have any more advice, especially in, in terms of having somebody become your sponsor that's not your direct manager, um, how, how to cultivate that relationship? Wonderful question, thank you. So, I mean, what Sandberg wrote is totally accurate. Like, it's so awkward uh, being on the receiving end of that question because it's not specific. Like, can you be my mentor? Or can you be my sponsor? It doesn't have a specific ask in it. So as much as you can, get, as, get specific about what you're asking. That could look like, um, hey, I don't uh, have a way of seeing what projects are coming down the pipeline that I could be a leader in. Can you help me see those? Or can you put my name in for those? Um, that could be like, hey, could you give me feedback once in a while on this specific aspect of my work that you see? Like whatever that um, specific grounded question you can develop, that's like the best way to start to cultivate that sponsorship relationship. Thank you. It's a lot of ground to cover. <laughs> Gonna work out. Hi, um, I was just wondering, earlier you mentioned that it's um, risky for marginalized sponsors to be sponsoring marginalized sponsees. Yeah. So I was just wondering in what ways is it risky for the managers and also how can the sponsees help um, prevent or alleviate those risky factors? Totally. It's all that in-group bias thing. It's a great question. So if you click on that resources page that I mentioned, there's a bunch of studies about this. The tactics-wise, it's often to get that spectrum of sponsors as a member of an underrepresented group. That way you're not only relying on someone who looks like you, because again, it's 
for all the in-group bias reasons, the perception of in-group bias, uh, marginalized folks who sponsor people who look like them actually get penalized in a lot of really subtle and like uncomfortable ways. So yeah, having the diversity of folks is really important. And look at that research, yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. What would you do if you don't think anyone in your workspace would be a good mentor? That's a great question. So I, uh, <laughs> that's tough. Um, <laughs> So especially now that I've gone out on my own, I've leveraged the, the network around me. So even if there's not someone at your organization who might be a good fit for you, rely on your network. So go to meetups, come to events like this, find other people who could be mentors, and again, develop that crew of people that you can lean on to support you. I would also recommend in your organization, even if it's not in your discipline, there might be people who would be good fits to help you. So one of uh, the people who mentored me a lot at Etsy was actually the chief finance officer. So I'm an engineering leader, but it was really helpful to have her advice as well. <laughs> I'd be happy to, we could talk about it. Sponsor though, it's different, yeah. Um, so I was just wondering, it's a weird echo speaking into this. <laughs> um, if you're a manager of somebody who's kind of not really standing out for themselves and, you know, uh, asking for these things or letting you know when they need something, how do you draw that out of that person? How do you encourage them to sort of give you more of that? Yeah. So given that chapter of Camille's book, I've actually, a bunch of managers who I know have shared that book with their direct reports specifically to be like, I need you to step up in these ways. Like you need to, uh, to represent your career to me and like to own that path for yourself in an equal partnership with me. And here are some ways that you can do it. Um, I think, it comes down to them understanding what the consequences of not doing that is. So like articulating for them, like they're not gonna get very far if they can't ask for what they need or, or if they don't feel responsible for themselves. So helping them see the pitfalls there is, is probably the best shot you have. Good luck. One more. Um, on the other side of things, if you are a mentee, how would you give feedback to a mentor or even break up with them? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, breaking up with them is is really uncomfortable, but you can be you can just not ask them for more time. <laughs> so just like, oh yeah, no, I'm actually super busy with this other project. I actually don't need to meet for a while. Thank you so much. This has been really helpful to me. If you think it'd be beneficial for them to hear the feedback, and I generally believe that people want feedback, even if it's critical feedback, look up how to deliver really difficult feedback in the most graceful way possible and structure it. So it usually looks like uh, observation of the behavior describing the impact of that behavior and then either asking them to change it or like offering them a question that's like, hey, how, how might we go about fixing this together? That was great, I like talking about feedback, so thank you for that. Isn't that technically called ghosting? Ghosting? Yeah. Not if you tell them that you don't wanna meet with them anymore, yeah. So if you're just like, hey, sorry, not ghosting. <laughs> don't ghost your mentors. <laughs> Laura, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Dan. That's fantastic. Thanks, everybody.